Tonight, we have a special treat for you. We searched deep in our vault and uncovered a piece of tape that we think you'll really enjoy. The program is from an author series that was produced at the Cambridge Public Library back in 1995 and features a Harvard Law School student reading from a memoir that he wrote titled, Dreams from My Father, a story of race and inheritance. This particular law school student distinguished himself as the first black editor of the Harvard Law Review and then some years later as the first African-American president of the United States. Sit back and enjoy a special archival presentation with Barack Obama. Good evening. Thank you very much. I, uh, I noticed today as I was in the hotel room getting ready that uh, Colin Powell is also here today. Uh, we were going to coordinate our tours, uh, and uh, he was a little worried that I'd siphon off the crowds, but uh, it looks like he did OK. Um, I'm very happy to be here today, although I, I admit that when I am in uh, libraries in Cambridge, I get uh, exam flashbacks. I start getting, uh, breaking out into cold sweats. But uh, this is, in fact, the first time that I've been uh, to the Cambridge Public Library, which shows you the kind of life we lead over at the law school. Uh, we don't uh, leave campus too much. Um, a little bit about m myself and the book. A uh, little preface. Uh, as was said in the introduction, my father was a black African, and my mother uh, was a, a white American. And much of my life was spent trying to reconcile the terms of my birth, uh, that divided heritage, with the realities of race and nationality uh, tribal identities uh, that exist not just in this country but also overseas. And in the silence, my mind began to rework Ray's words that day with Kurt. All the discussions we'd had before that, the events of that night. And by the time I had dropped my friends off, I had begun to see a new map of the world, one that was frightening in its simplicity, suffocating in its implications. We were always playing on the white man's court, Ray had told me, by the white man's rules. If the principal or the coach or a teacher or Kurt wanted to spit in your face, he could because he had power and you did not. If he decided not to, if he treated you like a man or came to your defense, it was because he knew that the words you spoke, the clothes you wore, the books that you read, your ambitions and desires were already his. Whatever he decided to do, it was his decision to make, not yours. And because of that fundamental power he held over you, because it preceded and would outlast his individual motives and inclinations, any distinction between good and bad whites held negligible meaning. In fact, you couldn't even be sure that everything you had assumed to be an expression of your black, unfettered self, the humor, the song, the behind-the-back pass, had been freely chosen by you. At best, these things were a refuge. At worst, a trap. Following this maddening logic, the only thing you could choose as your own was withdrawal into a smaller and smaller coil of rage, until being black meant only the knowledge of your own powerlessness and your own defeat. And the final irony, should you refuse this defeat and lash out at your captors, they would have a name for that too, a name that could cage you just as good like paranoid, or militant, or violent, or nigger. Over the next few months, I looked to corroborate this nightmare vision of mine. I gathered up books from the library, Baldwin, Ellison, Hughes, Wright, Dubois. At night, I would close the door to my room, telling my grandparents I had homework to do. And there I would sit and wrestle with words, locked in suddenly desperate argument, trying to reconcile the world as I had found it with the terms of my birth. But there seemed to be no escape to be had. In every page of every book, in Bigger Thomas and Invisible Men, I kept finding the same anguish, the same doubt, a self-contempt that neither irony nor intellect seemed able to deflect. Even Dubois' learning in Baldwin's love and Langston's humor eventually succumbed to its corrosive force. Each man finally forced 
to doubt art's redemptive power, each man finally forced to withdraw, one to Africa, one to Europe, one deeper into the bowels of Harlem, but all of them in the same weary flight, all of them exhausted bitter men, the devil at their heels. Only Malcolm X's autobiography seemed to offer something different. His repeated acts of self-creation spoke to me the blunt poetry of his words, his insistence on respect, promised a new and uncompromising order, martial in its discipline, forged through sheer force of will. All the other stuff, the talk of blue-eyed devils and apocalypse, was incidental to that program, I decided. Religious baggage that Malcolm himself seemed to have safely abandoned towards the end of his life. And yet, even as I imagined myself following Malcolm's call, one line in the book stayed with me. For he spoke of a wish he'd once had, the wish that the white blood that ran through him there by an act of violence might somehow be expunged. I knew that for Malcolm, that wish would never be incidental. I knew as well that traveling down the road to self-respect my own white blood would never recede into mere abstraction. So I was left to wonder what else I would be severing if and when I left my mother and my grandparents at some uncharted border. And two, if Malcolm's discovery towards the end of his life that some whites might live beside him as brothers in Islam seemed to offer some hope of eventual reconciliation, that hope appeared in a distant future, in a far off land, where were the people who would work towards this future and populate this new world? After a basketball at the university one day, Ray and I happened to strike up a conversation with a tall, gaunt man named Malik, who played with us now and again. Malik mentioned that he was a follower of the Nation of Islam. But that since Malcolm had died and he had moved to Hawaii, he no longer went to mosque or political meetings, although he still sought comfort in solitary prayer. One of the guys sitting nearby must have overheard us for he leaned over with a sagacious expression on his face. Y'all talking about Malcolm, huh? Malcolm tells us like it is, no doubt about it. Yeah, another guy said, but I tell you what, you won't see me moving to no African jungle anytime soon. Or some goddamn desert somewhere sitting on a carpet with a bunch of Arabs, no sir. And you, you won't see me stop eating no ribs, either. <laughs> Gotta have them ribs. And pussy, too. Don't Malcolm talk about no pussy? Now, you know that ain't gonna work. I noticed Ray laughing and looked at him sternly. What are you laughing at? I said to him. You never even read Malcolm. You don't even know what he says. Ray grabbed the basketball out of my hand and headed for the opposite rim. I don't need no books to tell me how to be black, he shouted over his head. I started to answer, then turned to Malik, expecting some words of support. But the Muslim said nothing, his bony face set in a faraway smile. I decided to keep my own counsel after that, learning to disguise my feverish mood. That night, I drove into Waikiki, past the bright-lit hotels and down towards the Alawai Canal. It took me a while to recognize the house with its wobbly porch and low-pitched roof. Inside, the light was on and I could see Frank sitting in his overstuffed chair, a book of poetry in his lap, his reading glasses slipping down his nose. I sat in the car, watching him for a time, then finally got out and tapped on the door. The old man barely looked up as he rose to undo the latch. It had been three years since I'd seen him. Want a drink? He asked me. I nodded and watched him pull down a bottle of whiskey and two plastic cups from the kitchen cupboard. He looked the same, his mustache a little whiter, dangling like dead ivy over his heavy upper lip, his cut-off jeans with a few more holes and tied at the waist with a length of rope. So how's your grandpa? He's all right. 
So what are you doing here? I wasn't sure. I told Frank some of what had happened. He nodded and poured us each a shot. Funny cat, your grandfather, he said. You know we, we grew up maybe 50 miles apart? I shook my head. We sure did. Both of us lived near Wichita. We didn't know each other, of course. I was long gone by the time he was old enough to remember anything. I might have seen some of his people, though. Might have passed them on the street. If I did, I would have had to step off the sidewalk to give him room. Your grandpa ever tell you about things like that? I threw the whiskey down my throat, shaking my head again. No, Frank said. I don't suppose he would have. Stan doesn't like to talk about that part of Kansas much. Makes him uncomfortable. Why, he told me once about a black girl they hired to look after your mother. A preacher's daughter, I think it was. Told me how she became a regular part of the family. That's how he remembers it, you understand. This girl coming in to look after somebody else's children, her mother coming in to do somebody else's laundry, a regular part of the family. I reached for the bottle, this time pouring my own. Frank wasn't watching me now. His eyes were closed, his head leaning against the back of his chair, his big wrinkled face like a carving of stone. You can't blame your grandfather for what he is, Frank said. He's basically a good man. But he doesn't know me any more than he knew that girl that looked after your mother. He can't know me, not the way I know him. Maybe some of these Hawaiians can, or the Indians on the reservation. They've seen their fathers humiliated, their mothers desecrated. But your grandfather will never know what that feels like. That's why he can come over here and drink my whiskey and fall asleep in that chair you're sitting in right now. Sleep like a baby. See, that's something I can never do in his house. Never. Doesn't matter how tired I get, I still have to watch myself. I have to be vigilant for my own survival. Frank opened his eyes. What I'm trying to tell you is, your grandma is right to be scared. She's at least as right as your grandpa is. She understands that black people have a reason to hate. That's just how it is. For your sake, I wish it were otherwise. But it's not. So you might as well get used to it. Frank closed his eyes again. His breathing slowed until he seemed to be asleep. I thought about waking him, then decided against it and walked back to the car. The earth shook under my feet, ready to crack open at any moment. I stopped, trying to steady myself, and knew for the first time that I was utterly alone. They're rooted in the imperfections of man. And solving these problems will re require changes in government policy, but it will also require a change in hearts and a change in minds. I believe in keeping guns off the streets of the inner city, and that our leaders must say so in the face of the gun manufacturers' lobby. But I and moreover, given the increasing diversity of America's populations, the dangers of sectarianism are greater than ever. Whatever we once were, we are no longer a Christian nation, at least not just. We are also a Jewish nation, and a Muslim nation, and a Buddhist nation, and a Hindu nation, and a nation of non-believers. And even if we did have only Christians, in our midst, if we expelled every non-Christian from the United States of America, whose Christianity would we teach in the schools? Would it be James Dobson's or Al Sharpton's? Which passages of scripture 
should guide our public policy. Should we go with uh, Leviticus, which uh, suggests slavery is okay, and that eating uh, shellfish is an abomination? Or we could go uh, with uh, Deuteronomy, which suggests stoning your child if he strays from the faith? Or should we just stick to the Sermon on the Mount, a passage that is so radical that it's doubtful that our own Defense Department would survive its application? We, so before we get carried away, let's read our Bibles now. Folks haven't been reading their Bible. Once they established that, then it would be easy to bring in the one, as Oprah Winfrey crowned him. I'm also ashamed to say the Hollywood crowd was a big part of the tearing down of President Bush. And they had a great influence in bringing in Obama in as well. Never mind that it was as clear as the nose on your face who Obama was attached to. Nothing seemed to matter. It was amazing to me how the media and the young generation were taken in by Obama's false haloistic presence and all his attachments to all the wrong people, heirs, Wright, Flager, Alinsky, didn't matter one iota. <laughs> Obama, as a candidate, portrayed himself as a moderate, but turned out to be wildly radical. The way he played his deception is interesting, but his campaign was meticulously thought through, well organized, and their techniques of outreach to gather support and funds through the internet were innovative, and their Hollywood savvy in the use of media was masterful. All their strategies should be carefully looked at to see if we might mimic them in a positive, legal way. My most pressing concern at this hour is the safety of Israel. I think Obama has no idea that Israel was built on the blood and sweat of the Jewish people, every blade of grass, every tree has been a successful e effort because of the Jewish people understanding they would have a safe homeland forever. He could not possibly understand this or he would know that the Jewish people have tried time and time again to give the Palestinians land and bring a peaceful solution. But every attempt every attempt was returned with violence. The Palestinians used Gaza to attack Israel. As far as I'm concerned, their only agenda is to wipe Israel off the face of the earth. And he represent, reprimands the Israeli people, Obama, like he's a professor and they're the school children. I was embarrassed to watch his press conference with the great war hero Benjamin Netanyahu, who has helped keep his country safe for many years. Obama sat there with complete arrogance that he is now the new American power, able to dictate what he thinks is best for Israel. So how worried are we supposed to be now? Was I hearing things when he said that Iran might have the right to nuclear power? Are we supposed to be sitting and waiting, watching for the possibility of a new holocaust? Who's going to take the responsibility to keep America, Israel safe? I'll tell you why this really scares the hell out of me, because everything Obama has recommended has turned out to be disastrous. His so-called stimulus package and his budget will leave our grandchildren with great burdens 
and great debts. The government is now owning car companies and banks, and we're losing job after job. Our unemployment rate is an astronomic 9.4, and of course they send out Joe Biden, one of the great double talkers of our time, to tell us the unemployment rate is getting better. The government wants to run health care and tell people what doctors they can see, how much they can make, what cars to drive, and they're killing off the entrepreneurs who are the backbone of our economy. It's no wonder that the Russian newspaper Pravda, the former house organ for the Soviet communist regime, recently said the American descent into Marxism is happening with breathtaking speed. We can blame Nancy Pelosi, Harry Reid, Chris Dodd, George Soros, David Axelrod, and their ilk for the downfall of this country. It saddens me greatly to think we were the great power for good in the world. We as Americans knew America to be strong, and we were the liberators of the entire world. We are becoming a weak nation. Obama really thinks he is a soft-spoken Julius Caesar. He thinks he's going to conquer the world with his soft-spoken sweet talk, and really thinks he's going to bring all the enemies of the world into a little playground where they'll swing each other back and forth. We and we alone are the right frame of mind to free this nation from this Obama oppression. And let's give thanks to all the great people like Sean Hannity, Rush Limbaugh, Bill O'Reilly, Laura Ingram, Mark Levin, William Bennett, Glenn Beck, Hugh Hewitt, Dennis Prager, Michael Medved, Dennis Miller, Dick Morris, Ann Coulter, John Kasich, Michael Steele, Carl Rove, Newt Gingrich, Thomas Sowell, Victor Davis Hanson, Shelby Steele, Charles Krautheimer, Michelle Malkin, Fred Barnes, and so many others. Let's give thanks to them for not giving up and staying the course to bring an end to this false prophet, Obama. Obviously, you're here to talk about uh, the anniversary for U.S.-China diplomatic relations. But if you had to say this is going to be the country or the conflict or the place that will define the Obama administration, what would it be? Well, uh, the, uh, the president-elect is coming into office at a moment when there are upheavals in many parts of the world simultaneously. You have India, Pakistan, and you, you have uh, uh, the uh, jihadist movement. So he can't really say that it's one problem, that it's the most important one. Uh, but he can give a new impetus to American foreign policy, big, partly because the reception of him is so extraordinary around the world. I think his task will be to develop an overall strategy for America in this period, when really a new world order can be created. It's a great opportunity. It isn't just a crisis. Are you confident about the people uh, President-elect Obama has chosen to surround him because he does not have a great deal of experience? No, he's, uh, he has appointed an extraordinarily able group of people in both the international and financial field. Mr. Secretary, we thank you very much for your time. Dr. Kissinger, thank Appreciate you very much. Nice to see you. Former Secretary of State, Henry Kissinger. Who is this man, a young Barack Obama, referred to in his book as Frank? Now, we reveal the details and tell you just how far someone has gone to downplay this blast from the past. <laughs> And welcome back to this special edition of Hannity's America, Obama and Friends, History of Radicalism, Volume 2. Now, as we've shown you, Barack Obama has a long history of associating with controversial figures. In his first book, he talks about a close friendship with a man that he only refers to as Frank. 
But years later, he disappeared from another edition of Obama's memoirs. Now, what we show you here is the reason why, and we think you'll understand. That's a lie! God. America. Barack Obama's relationship with controversial figures seems to be a list that keeps growing, and it may have started at a very early age. After his father left the family, when he was only two years old, his mother remarried and moved back to Indonesia. Obama then returned back to Hawaii in 1971 to live with his grandparents, where he could benefit from an American education. He would live there for the next eight years. During this time, when a young Barack Obama would have looked to his father for guidance and advice, there was nobody to turn to, and some say he found what he'd been looking for in a friend of his grandfather's. Obama refers to this person in his book, Dreams from My Father, as a poet named Frank. Obama writes, quote, he lived in a dilapidated house in a rundown section of Waikiki. Frank was an intriguing figure. Quote, with his books and whiskey breath and the hint of harder knowledge behind the hooded eyes. So who is this man named Frank? David Ferdozo, the author of The Case Against Barack Obama, says it's none other than Frank Marshall Davis. Frank Marshall Davis was a famous poet and a uh, member of the Communist Party USA. Davis was a very provocative figure. His poetry advocated for black soldiers to take up arms against the United States. He wrote, hey, Uncle Sam, you sure you want to give me a gun? He was a very radical uh, political communist. A 1951 report of the Commission of Subversive Activities publicly identified Frank Marshall Davis as a member of the old Moscow-controlled Communist Party USA. Now, Davis was a known communist sympathizer beholden to the same elements that sought the overthrow of our government and the end to American power. And this was the man that Obama looked to for guidance? Davis became something of a father figure at a time when Obama was wondering and struggling with all these racial issues, someone who could guide him to help him understand race. Of course, Davis's view of race, though, was very radical. One of the most defining moments of Obama's early years was an event involving his grandmother. Obama's grandmother had had an incident in which a black panhandler had approached her, I guess, a, a bit aggressively. And she really, uh, she really flipped over it. She kind of freaked out. And Obama's grandfather uh, uh, took this to mean that she had been prejudiced against the man because he was black. Obama wrote in his book, quote, the words were like a fist to my stomach. So who did the future presidential candidate turn to during that time? He went to visit Frank Marshall Davis, who told him basically, white people can never really understand you. They have not seen the kinds of the kinds of things black people felt they have not felt the kind of humiliation black people have felt and he told him black people have reason to hate and in fact your white grandmother understands that fact this clearly had a lasting effect on Obama while defending his relationship with the Reverend Jeremiah Wright he spoke of that fateful day I can no more disown him than I can disown my white grandmother a woman who helped raise me, a woman who sacrificed again and again for me, but a woman who once confessed her fear of black men who passed her by on the street. Before leaving to go to Occidental College in 1979, Obama turned to Davis for some last minute advice. The radical writer told Barack Obama, quote, you're not going to college to get educated, you're going to get trained. They will train you to forget what you already know. They will train you so good that you'll be believing what they tell you about equal opportunity and quote the American way. So does Obama's relationship with Frank Marshall Davis sound familiar? Well, it should. Who cares about what a poor black man has to face every day in a country and a culture controlled by rich white people? Was Obama looking for another mentor, another radical father figure to continue where Frank Marshall Davis left off? Frank Marshall Davis and Reverend Jeremiah Wright approach racial issues the same way basically that there can be no true reconciliation between people of different races. The book Dreams from My Father, for which references Frank Marshall Davis, was written in 1995 before Obama had national aspirations. However, in the audiobook version, which was released in 2005, Obama was already a U.S. senator and significant references to Frank Marshall left out. 
So the question is, why are so many of these passages missing? And who decided to take them out? Now Hannity's America contacted Random House Audio about the missing references. And a spokeswoman said, quote, it was a collaborative effort in which Obama was involved and in which he had approval over all cuts. So was Obama trying to hide his relationship with Davis just as he tried to hide the true nature of his relationship with the Reverend Jeremiah Wright and others? And can you blame him? Davis was a communist obsessed with race who used all sorts of outlets to peddle his radical ideas. As I've said before, this aspect of our strategy was moving too slowly, but the fall of Ramadi has galvanized the Iraqi government. So with the additional steps I ordered last month, we're speeding up training of ISIL forces, including volunteers from Sunni tribes in Anbar province. And by the way, with respect to my concerns about uh, privacy issues, I will leave this office at some point, sometime in the last next three and a half years. And uh, after that, I will be a private citizen. And I suspect that, uh, you know, on, on a list of people who might be targeted, uh, you know, so that uh, somebody could read their emails or, or listen to their phone calls, I'd probably be pretty high on that list. But it's not as if I don't have a personal interest in making sure my privacy is protected. But I know that the people who are involved uh, in these programs, they operate like professionals. And these things are very narrowly circumscribed. They're very focused. Uh, and in the abstract, you can complain about Big Brother and how this is uh, uh, a potential, uh, you, know, you know, program run amok. But when you actually look at the details, then I think we've struck the right balance. Having said that, though, if you are outside of the intelligence community, if you are the ordinary person and you start seeing a bunch of headlines saying, yeah, U.S., Big Brother, looking down on you, collecting telephone records, etc. Well, understandably, people would be concerned. I would be, too, if I wasn't uh, inside the government. President Obama is a constitutional lawyer. That he knew. But when he became president, because he made us all feel we're going to have a change here. I was not under any illusion. And I said it before my brother was elected. And I went out early in the morning and voted for him. But I said on CNN when they asked me, what do you think? I said, he's a brilliant young man with a lot of good ideas. But I'm not under any illusion that he can change the reality of this nation. Now, that's not diminishing him. But don't you know when you become a governor, a senator, somebody in political power, you don't see the power behind the power. I have a watch that's moving. I can see what's going on on the outside. But the real power is not on the outside. There's something on the inside that's unseen that makes what you see move. You the same. I'm looking at you. You looking at me. But I'm seeing a physical person, but I don't see the power in you that moves your tongue, that moves your eyes, that moves your brain to think. That is unseen. And the real power is not what you see. The real power is the unseen reality that moves what you see. Can you understand what I'm saying? Now, who is the unseen power? that move presidents. What happens to a president when he says, the first thing I'm going to do when I become president is close down Guantanamo Bay? Two years, nine months into the presidency, Guantanamo still open. What happened? 
See? There are forces. When my brother became president, he surrounded himself with the people from Wall Street. Yes, he did. Timothy Geithner, who is he? He, yes, he was from Goldman Sachs, right? Federal Reserve man, Larry Summers. These are all Wall Street folk. Well, if he trusts them, listen to me carefully, if he trusts them, they then said, we need a stimulus package. If we don't get a stimulus package, we're going to have the worst recession since the 1930s. What would you expect Obama to do? These are the people he brought around him to advise him. So he took their advice. And over 700 billion dollars, 800 billion, stimulus. Uh, did, did, did you get stimulated? <laughs> no. And not only that, after, but you didn't remember that just before he did that, George W. Bush got over 700 billion, don't nobody know where the money went. Now when you're surrounded by that kind of power that makes monetary policy, that prints money, did you know that the Federal Reserve printed 16 trillion dollars and gave it out to banks in Europe and America and corporations and the president didn't know nothing about it? Well, what kind of power is that that you can print that kind of money and start doling it out and the man that we elected as president don't know what is going on. You talk back to me and you'll have to tell me he's not the power. Neither was George W. Bush. No president has the real power. The power is what moves the money. The power is the international bankers. They run this. Corporations have lobbyists in Washington that spent over $2 billion last year for legislation to be passed that favors them, not you. I said this once or twice, but it bears repeating. And you can keep your plan if you are satisfied with it. If you like the plan you have, you can keep it. If you like your plan and you like your doctor, you won't have to do a thing. You keep your plan. If you like your health care plan, you'll be able to keep your health care plan. If you've got health insurance, you can keep it. If you like your health care plan, you will keep your plan. If you've got health insurance, you like your doctor, you like your plan, you can keep your doctor, you can keep your plan. If you have insurance that you like, then you will be able to keep that insurance. If you like your doctor or health care plan, you can keep it. If you like your health care plan, you can he keep your health care plan. If you like your health care plan, you can keep your health care plan. If you like your private health insurance plan, you can keep your plan. If you like your health care plan, you can keep your health care plan. If you like your private health insurance plan, you can keep it. If you want to keep the health insurance you got, you can keep it. If you like the insurance plan you have now, you can keep it. And if you like your insurance plan, you will keep it. So if you like your plan, you can keep your plan. If you like your plan, keep your plan. If you like your current insurance, you will keep your current insurance. If you like your plan, you can keep your plan. 
If you like your plan, you can keep your plan. If you're happy with what you got, nobody's changing it. Russia's actions are a problem. They don't pose the number one national security threat to the United States. Uh, I continue to be much more concerned when it comes to our security with the prospect of uh, a nuclear weapon going off in Manhattan, which is part of the reason why uh, the United States, showing its continued international leadership, uh, has organized uh, a forum over the last several years that's been able to help eliminate uh, that threat in a consistent way. If you've been successful, you, don't, you didn't get there on your own. You, you didn't get there on your own. I, I'm always struck by people who think, well, it must be because I was just so smart. There are a lot of smart people out there. It must be because I worked harder than everybody else. Let me tell you something. There are a whole bunch of hard-working people out there. If you were successful, somebody along the line gave you some help. There was a great teacher somewhere in your life. Somebody helped to create this unbelievable American system that we had that allowed you to thrive. Somebody invested in roads and bridges. If you got a business, that you didn't build that. Somebody else made that happen. The internet didn't get invented on its own. First of all, the integration of national economies into a global economy, that's here. That's done. And so the question is not whether or not there's going to be an international global economy. There is one. And we're building an inclusive society uh, in which everybody's got a fair shot. That's how we're going to solve these problems. So we're, we're going to keep on pushing hard to shape a, uh, an international order that works for our people. So we're, we're going to keep on pushing hard to shape a, uh, an international order that works for our people. How much does America want to invest around the world? Uh, we, we're seeing a new world order now being built, a post-World War II world order. And I don't think America can retreat from that. I think we have to balance and adapt and adjust uh, to the realities and the currents of this new world order. Now, uh, when you first become president, one of the peop uh, questions that people ask you is, uh, What's really going on at Area 51? <laughs> when I wanted to know, I called Shirley MacLaine. <laughs> I think I just became the first president to ever publicly mention Area 51. <laughs> How's that, Shirley? So. We love Shirley MacLaine. So this is something I feel like, th if I was the president, and it's unlikely that that is ever going to happen. You never know. <laughs> if I was the president. It was unlikely that I was going to be president. <laughs> <laughs> the moment I was inaugurated, my hand would, would just, it'd still be hot from touching the Bible, and I would <laughs> immediately race to um, wherever they hold, have the files uh, about Area 51 and the UFOs, yeah. and I go through everything to find out what happened. Right. Did you do that? That's why you will not be president. <laughs>
because uh, that's, that, that, that's, that, that's the first thing that you would do. Um, <laughs> the, the aliens won't list. let it happen. <laughs> <laughs> you reveal all their secrets. <laughs> They, look, they, they exercise strict control over us. Now, you know, there are a lot of people that are going to examine your, your facial expressions here, um, every, every twitch, everything, oh, no. and say, and of course, so did you look? Did you see? Did you explore? I, I, I can't reveal anything. Oh, really? Because President Clinton said he did go right in, and he did check, and there was nothing. Well, you know, that's, that's what we're instructed to say. <laughs> All right. Hi, I'm Jimmy Kimmel. Are you sad that the video is over? Well, subscribe to our YouTube channel and you will never be sad again, ever. Of course the elections will not be rigged. What does that mean? <laughs> the federal government doesn't run the election process. States, and cities and communities all across the country, they're the ones who set up the voting systems and the voting booths. And uh, if Mr. Trump is suggesting that there is a conspiracy theory that is uh, being propagated uh, across the country, including in places like Texas, <laughs> uh, uh, where Typically, it's not Democrats who are in charge of uh, voting booths. Um, that's ridiculous. That doesn't make any sense. And I don't think anybody would take that seriously. Let us never tolerate outrageous conspiracy theories concerning the attacks of September the 11th. Malicious lies that attempt to shift the blame away from the terrorists themselves, away from the guilty. Mr. President, I do want to get right to the news of this week. Sure. For so many Americans, the terrorism in Boston. Yeah. Many people have wondered if it took you right back to 9-11 when you heard it. Well, at first, uh, you know, I was deeply concerned uh, that um, there might have been a organized plot. Uh, I don't know all the facts. I don't think we all know all the facts. But I was deeply concerned that uh, this could have been... Um, uh, you know, another cons uh, organized, highly organized attack on the country. And it still may be, I, again, I don't know the facts, but I do know that it's really hard to protect the homeland. I mean, the, 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 those who want to do harm only have to be right one time, and we have to be right 100% of the time. Uh, you know, another cons uh, uh, You know, another cons uh, uh, you know, another cons uh, organized, highly organized attack on the country. The former president remembering what it is like in the crucible. Last week, the president of 9-11 watching the president of the bombings in Boston. The terrorism in Boston. Yeah. Many people have wondered if it took you right back to 9-11 when you heard it. I was deeply concerned that uh, this could have been... Um, uh, you know, another highly organized attack on the country, and it still may be, I, again, I don't know the facts, but I do know that it's really hard to protect the homeland. By violent extremism, we don't just mean the terrorists who are killing innocent people, we also mean the ideologies, it's like Al-Qaeda and ISIL. And this week we are focused on prevention, preventing these groups from radicalizing, recruiting, or inspiring others to violence in the first place. And so it makes individuals, especially young people who already may be disaffected or alienated, more ripe for radicalization. To face a third challenge, and that's addressing the political grievances that are exploited by terrorists. When governments oppress their people, deny human rights, stifle dissent, it sows the seeds of extremism and violence. It makes those communities more vulnerable to recruitment. What's true, though, is that when millions of people, especially youth, are impoverished and have no hope for the future, when corruption inflicts daily humiliations on people, when there are no outlets by which people can express their concerns, resentments fester. The risk of instability and extremism grow. Where young people have no education, they are more vulnerable 
to conspiracy theories and radical ideas because it's not tested against anything else. They've got nothing to weigh. And we've seen this across the Middle East and North Africa. And terrorist groups are all too happy to step into a void. What I was suggesting, you, you're absolutely right that John McCain has not uh, talked about my Muslim faith, and you're absolutely right that that has not Christian come faith. at my, my Christian faith. Assalamu alaikum. Many other Americans have Muslims in their families or have lived in a Muslim-majority country. I know because I am one of them. But my father came from a Kenyan family that includes generations of Muslims. As a boy, I spent several years in Indonesia and heard the call of the Azan at the break of dawn. But I have known Islam on three continents before coming to the region where it was first revealed. That experience guides my conviction. As the Holy Quran tells us, the Holy Quran teaches that the Holy Quran tells us, and the Holy Quran also says, we will convey our deep appreciation for the Islamic faith, which has done so much over the centuries to shape the world. I would like to speak directly to the people and leaders of the Islamic Republic of Iran. Their great and celebrated culture. Over many centuries, your art, your music, literature, and innovation have made the world a better and more beautiful place. We know that you are a great civilization, and your accomplishments have earned the respect of the United States and the world. I also know civilization's debt to Islam. It was Islam at places like Uluzara that carried the light of learning through so many centuries, paving the way for Europe's renaissance and enlightenment. It was innovation in Muslim communities that developed the order of algebra our magnetic compass and tools of navigation, our mastery of pens and printing, our understanding of how disease spreads and how it can be healed. Islamic culture has given us majestic arches and soaring spires, timeless poetry and cherished music, elegant calligraphy, and places of peaceful comp contemplation. They have fought in our wars, they have served in our government, they have stood for civil rights, they have started businesses, they have taught at our universities, they've excelled in our sports arenas, they've won Nobel Prizes, built our tallest building, and lit the Olympic torch. And when the first Muslim American was recently elected to Congress, he took the oath to defend our Constitution using the same Holy Quran. In ancient times and in our times, Muslim communities have been at the forefront of innovation and education. Islam is not part of the problem in combating violent extremism. It is an important part of promoting peace. The enduring faith of over a billion people is so much bigger than the narrow hatred of a few. In the United States, rules on charitable giving have made it harder for Muslims to fulfill their religious obligation. That's why I'm committed to working with American Muslims to ensure that they can fulfill Saka. It is important for Western countries to avoid impeding Muslim citizens from practicing religion as they see fit. And I consider it part of my responsibility as President of the United States to fight against negative stereotypes of Islam wherever they appear. We do not consider ourselves a Christian nation. Or the United States has been enriched by Muslim Americans. Since our founding, American Muslims have enriched the United States. Islam has always been a part of America's story. There is a mosque in every state in our union and over 1,200 mosques within our borders. You know, one of the points I want to make is, is that if you actually took the number of Muslims, Americans, uh, you know, we'd be one of the mo largest Muslim countries in the world. Let there be no doubt, Islam is a part of America.
he did bow to the Muslim king while he did not do it to the British Queen of England. And by bowing, he showed the world that I am subservient. I do owe, uh, bow down to you as a Muslim king, something no other uh, president has done with Saudi Arabia. The Saudi king is his peer. He is not his subordinate in order to bow for him. And this is exactly what Obama did. Usually it is out of respect that someone would nod his head when bowing to royalty and the ladies will give curtsy. But Obama went beyond what is required as a head of state and bowed to the Saudi king and that's unacceptable. Right, it sent the wrong symbol. What, when you say it's saying it sends the wrong signal, what signal do you think it sends? It sent a message that Islam is superior to any other master or king or president in the world. That an American president bound to a Muslim king. It also sent a message that terrorism and jihadism is giving Islam the respect it, it should have on the world stage to the point that it made an American president for the first time in history bow to a Muslim king. Uh, I won't wear that uh, pin on my chest. It's a little weird, Alan, that in the middle of the campaign, the guy takes off the American flag <laughs> that most people wear because they're proud of their country. Let me speak as clearly and as plainly as I can. America is not and never will be at war with Islam. future must not belong to those who slander the prophet of Islam. Thank you. And Ed A. Shoma Mubarak. <laughs> Leaders and dignitaries of the European Union, representatives of our NATO alliance, distinguished guests, we meet here at a moment of testing for Europe and the United States, and for the international order that we have worked for generations to build. Throughout human history, societies have grappled with fundamental questions of how to organize themselves, the proper relationship between the individual and the state, the best means to resolve inevitable conflicts between states. And it was here in Europe, through centuries of struggle, through war and enlightenment, repression and revolution, that a particular set of ideals began to emerge. The belief that through conscience and free will, each of us has the right to live as we choose. The belief that power is des derived from the consent of the governed, and that laws and institutions should be established to protect that understanding. And those ideas eventually inspired a band of colonialists uh, across an ocean, and they wrote them into the founding documents that still guide America today, including the simple truth that all men and women are created equal. But those ideals have also been tested here in Europe and around the world. Those ideals have often been threatened by an older, more traditional view of power. This alternative vision argues that ordinary men and women are too small-minded to govern their own affairs that order and progress can only come when individuals surrender their rights to an all-powerful sovereign. Often, this alternative vision roots itself in the notion that by virtue of race or faith or ethnicity, some are inherently superior to others, and that individual identity must be defined by us versus them or that national greatness must flow not by what people stand for, but what they are against.
The podium is yours. The president, often criticized for his caution, is now doing things his own way. He's got a climate deal with China. He's issued an immigration order. We'll see how far he can take it. Good evening, everybody. <laughs> Welcome to the White House Correspondents' Dinner, the night when Washington celebrates itself. <laughs> Somebody's got to do it. <laughs> and welcome to the fourth quarter of my presidency. It's true, I... <laughs> that was Michelle cheering. Fact is, I feel more loose and relaxed than ever. Those Joe Biden shoulder massages, they're like magic. <laughs> you should try one. Oh, you have. <laughs> I am determined to make the most of every moment I have left. After the midterm elections, my advisors asked me, Mr. President, do you have a bucket list? And I said, well, I have something that rhymes with bucket list. <laughs> Take executive action on immigration? Bucket. New climate regulations? Bucket. It's the right thing to do. I continue to believe Mr. Trump will not be president. And the reason is because I have a lot of faith in the American people. And I think they recognize that being president is a serious job. It's not hosting a talk show or a reality show. It's not promotion. It's not marketing. It's hard. And a lot of people count on us getting it right. And it's not a matter of pandering and, 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 and doing whatever will get you in the news on a given day. And sometimes it requires you making hard decisions even when people don't like it. And doing things that are unpopular. And standing up for people who are vulnerable but don't have some powerful political constituency. And it requires being able to work with leaders around the world uh, in a way that reflects the importance of the office um, and gives people confidence that you know the facts and you know their names and you know where they are on a map and you know something about their history. And you're not just going to play to the crowd back home because they have their own crowds back home and you're trying to solve problems. And so, yeah, during primaries, people vent and they express themselves and it seems like entertainment and oftentimes it's reported just like entertainment. But as you get closer, reality has a way of intruding. And these are the folks who, who I have faith in, because they ultimately are going to say, whoever's standing where I'm standing right now has the nuclear codes with them and can order 21-year-olds into a firefight and have to make sure that the banking system doesn't collapse and is often responsible for not just the United States of America, but 20 other countries that are having big problems or are falling apart and are going to be looking for us to do something. And the American people are pretty sensible. 
and I think they'll make a, a, a sensible choice in the end. It is wonderful to be here at the White House Correspondents' Dinner. What a week. As some of you heard, the state of Hawaii released my official long-form birth certificate. Hopefully, that this puts all doubts to rest. But just in case there are any lingering questions, tonight, I'm prepared to go a step further. Tonight, for the first time, I am releasing my official birth video. <laughs> now, I warn you, no one has seen this footage in 50 years, not even me, but uh, let's take a look. Oh well, back to square one. I, I, I want to make clear to the Fox News table, that was a joke. Um, that was not my real birth video. That was a children's cartoon. Call Disney if you don't believe me. They have the original long-form version. <laughs> the Jonas Brothers are here. They're out there somewhere. Sasha and Malia are huge fans. But uh, boys don't get any ideas. I have two words for you. Predator drones. <laughs> you will never see it coming. You think I'm joking? <laughs> it gets worse. Just this week, Michelle Bachman actually, actually predicted that I would bring about the biblical end of days. <laughs> now that's a legacy. <laughs> that's big. I mean, Lincoln, Washington, they didn't do that. <laughs> the trail hasn't been easy for my fellow Democrats either. Uh, as we all know, Hillary's private emails got her in trouble. Uh, frankly, I thought it was going to be her private Instagram account that was going to cause her bigger problems. Hillary kicked things off by going completely unrecognized at a Chipotle. Not to be outdone, Martin O'Malley kicked things off by going completely unrecognized at a Martin O'Malley campaign event. <laughs> and Bernie Sanders might run. I, I like Bernie. Bernie's an interesting guy. Apparently, some folks really want to see a pot-smoking socialist in the White House. <laughs> we could get a third Obama term after all. <laughs> could happen. I have to also say that Africa's democratic progress is also at risk when leaders refuse to step aside when their terms end.
Now, now, let me be honest with you. I do not understand this. I am in my second term. It has been an extraordinary privilege for me to serve as the President of the United States. I cannot imagine a greater honor or a more interesting job. I love my work. But under our Constitution, I cannot run again. I can't run again. I actually think I'm a pretty good president. I think if I ran, I could win. But I can't. So there's a lot that I'd like to do to keep America moving, but the law is the law. And, and no one person is above the law, not even the president. And I'll be, I'll be honest with you, I'm looking forward to life after being president. I won't have such a big security detail all the time. It means I can go take a walk. I can spend time with my family. I can find other ways to serve. I can visit Africa more often. Anyway, as always, I want to close on a more serious note. You know, I often joke about tensions between me and the press, but uh, honestly, what they say doesn't bother me. I understand we've got an adversarial system. I'm a mellow sort of guy. And that's why I invited Luther, my anger translator, to join me here tonight. Hold on to your lily white butts. In our fast changing world, traditions like the White House Correspondents' Dinner are important. I mean, really? Because despite our differences, we count on the press to shed light on the most important issues of the day. And we can count on Fox News to terrify old white people with some nonsense. <laughs> Sharia law is coming to Cleveland, run for the damn hills. Y'all was ridiculous. We won't always see eye to eye. Oh, and CNN, thank you so much for the wall-to-wall -wall Ebola coverage. For two whole weeks, we were one step away from the walking dead. And then you all got up and just moved on to the next day. That was awesome. Oh, and by the way, just if you haven't noticed, you don't have Ebola! But I still deeply appreciate the work that you do. Y'all remember when I had that big old hole in the bottom of the Gulf of Mexico, and then I plugged it? Remember that? Which Obama's Katrina was that one? Was, it, was that 19, or was it, was it 20? Because I can't remember, I can't remember. Protecting our democracy is more important than ever. For example, the Supreme Court ruled that the donor who gave Ted Cruz $6 million was just exercising free speech. Yeah, it's the kind of speech like this. I just wasted $6 million. <laughs> and it's not just Republicans. Hillary will have to raise huge sums of money, too. Oh, yeah. <laughs> she gonna get that money. She gonna get all the money. Khaleesi is coming to Westeros. <laughs> so watch out. The nonstop focus on billionaire donors creates real problems for our democracy. And that's why we run it for a third time! No, 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 we're not. We're not? No. Who the hell said that? <laughs> but we do need to stay focused on some big challenges, like climate change. Hey, listen, y'all, if you haven't noticed, California is bone dry. <laughs> it looked like a trailer for the new Mad Max movie up in there. 
Y'all think that Bradley Cooper came here because he wants to talk to Chuck Todd? <laughs> he needed a glass of water! <laughs> Come on! The science is clear. The science is clear. Nine out of the 10 hottest years ever came in the last decade. Now, I'm not a scientist, but I do know how to count to 10. <laughs> Rising seas, more violent storms. You got mosquitoes, sweaty people on the train, stinking it up. It's just nasty. I mean, look at, us what, look at what's happening right now. Every serious scientist says we need to act. The Pentagon says it's a national security risk. Miami floods on a sunny day, and instead of doing anything about it, we've got elected officials throwing snowballs in the Senate. Okay, okay, Mr. It's a, okay I, I think they got it, bro. I, it is crazy. <laughs> what about our kids? What kind of stupid, short-sighted, irresponsible bull? Whoa, 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 hey! What? what? Okay, no, hey. What? All, all, all due respect, sir, you don't need an anger translator. You need counseling. <laughs> so now I'm, I'm, I'm out of here, man. I ain't trying to get into all this. Go. Luther, my anger translator, ladies and gentlemen. Now that I got that off my chest. You know, investigative journalism, explanatory journalism, journalism that exposes corruption and injustice and gives voice to the different and the marginalized the voiceless, that's power. It's a privilege. It's as important to America's trajectory, uh, to our values, our ideals, than anything that we could do in elected office. We remember journalists we lost over the past year. Journalists like Stephen Sotloff and James Foley, murdered for nothing more than trying to shine a light into some of the world's darkest corners. We remember the journalists unjustly imprisoned around the world, including our own Jason Rezan. For nine months, Jason has been imprisoned in Tehran for nothing more than writing about the hopes and the fears of the Iranian people, carrying their stories to the readers of the Washington Post in an effort to bridge our common humanity. As was already mentioned, Jason's brother Ali is here tonight, and. Uh, I have told him personally, we will not rest until we bring him home to his family, safe and sound. <laughs> These journalists and so many others view their work as more than just a profession, uh, but as a public good, an indispensable pillar of our society. So I want to give a toast to them. I raise a glass to them and all of you with the words of the American foreign correspondent Dorothy Thompson. It is not the fact of liberty, but the way in which liberty is exercised that ultimately determines whether liberty itself survives. Thank you for your devotion to exercising our liberty and to telling our American story. God bless you. God bless the United States of America. You can't say it, 
but you know it's true. <laughs> Good evening, everybody. It is an honor to be here at my last, and perhaps the last, White House Correspondents' Day. <laughs> You all look great. The end of the Republic has never looked better. <laughs> I do apologize. I know I was a little late tonight. I was running on CPT. <laughs> which stands for jokes that white people should not make. This material works well. I'm going to use it at Goldman Sachs next year. <laughs> Earn me some serious Tubmans. That's right. That's right. Eight years ago, I was a young man, full of idealism and vigor. And look at me now. I am gray, grizzled, just counting down the days till my death panel. In this last year, I do have more appreciation for those who've been with me on this amazing ride like one of our finest public servants, Joe Biden. God bless him. Love that guy. I love Joe Biden. I really do. Uh, I, and I want to thank him for his friendship, for his counsel, uh, for always giving it to me straight, for not shooting anybody in the face. Thank you, Joe. Well, let me conclude tonight on a more serious note. Uh, I want to thank the Washington Press Corps. I want to thank Carol for all that you do. You know, the free press is central to our democracy, and nah, I'm just kidding. You know I've got to talk about Trump. Come on. I'm just going to stop there. Come on. Although I am a little hurt that he's not here tonight. We had so much fun the last time. And it is surprising. You've got a room full of reporters, celebrities, cameras, and he says no. Is this dinner too tacky for the Donald? <laughs> what could he possibly be doing instead? Is he at home eating a Trump steak? <laughs> Tweeting out insults to Angela Merkel? What's he doing? But our decision has actually presented a bit of a dilemma because traditionally presidents don't stick around after they're done. And it's something that I've been brooding about a little bit. Uh, take a look. The Obamas are staying in D.C. for two years after the president leaves office. He's about to go from commander-in-chief to couch commander. For you, Chuck Todd. What am I going to do in D.C. for two years? You've got a real dilemma, Mr. President. I can't go every day, can I? I wish you liked better. These? What are these? Joe, they're the same. They capture different moods. Joe, I need some focus here. Comes in there during aviator time, thinks everything. I'm sorry, what's that? I, I said, Mr. President, that you had to be practical. And look, you can drive again, you're going to need a license. Uh, you love sports. Why don't you volunteer to work for one of the teams around here? Is this the Washington Wizards? 
I understand you're looking for some coaching help. Let's just say I coached my daughter's team a few times. Hello. Hello. Finally. So I'm going to be in D.C. for a while, and I thought I'd take up driving again. What's the name? Barack Hussein Obama. Thanks. Well, since you don't have a driver's license, you're going to need a birth certificate. Really? Really. It's real. Is it? It's real. But is it? Oh, Michelle left her phone. Huh. She's got Snapchat. Obamacare is great, and it's really working. Sign up now. Breaking news. Michelle Obama in hot water after posting this video earlier today. Obamacare is great, and it's really working. Sign up now. No? No. Did it get a lot of views at least? Honey, enough, enough. Why don't you just talk to somebody who's been through this? I gotta go to Soul Cycle. She's right. I know who I need to talk to. Hey, it's Barack. Listen, can we get together? Now that is a great move. Yeah, it's good for me. It's good for me. So, you got any advice for me? So now you want my advice? First, stop sending me all these LinkedIn requests. And second, here's the beauty of this whole thing. You've got all the time in the world to figure this out. You can just be you for a while. If you know how to do that again. So I can just be me. And I can wear my mom jeans in peace. I hate these tight jeans. Yeah, good. Yesterday, I had a beer at 11.30 in the morning. And you know, McDonald's now serves breakfast all day long. You know, Michelle's gonna be at spin class, so she'll never know. All right, let it go. You know, it won't be long, you'll be able to walk right out of the Oval Office singing zippity doo da, zippity a. <laughs> and you got plenty of time to work on your tan. And you know what? I finally got the grand bargain on a sweet Chevy Tahoe. Look here. Look here. Yeah. You want one? Breaking news: former President Barack Obama on his 347th round of golf for the year, and it's totally great. And Gloria, not a problem for anybody. I can't think of a reason to care, Wolf. And believe me, I've tried. There you go. I am still waiting for all of you to respond to my invitation to connect to LinkedIn. Uh, but I know you have jobs to do, which is what really brings us here tonight. I know that there are times that we've had differences, and that's inherent in our institutional roles. It's true of every president and his press corps. But we've always shared the same goal, to, to root our public discourse in the truth to open the doors of this democracy, uh, to do whatever we can to make our country and our world more free and more just. And I've always appreciated the role that you have all played as equal partners in reaching these goals. And our free press is why we once again recognize the real journalists who uncover the horrifying scandal and brought some measure of justice for thousands of victims throughout the world. They are here with us tonight. Uh, Sasha Pfeiffer, uh, Mike uh, Resendez, Walter Robinson, Matt Carroll, and Bed Brandley Jr. Please give them a big round of applause. <laughs> Our free press is why, once again, we honor uh, Jason Rezaian, as Carroll noted. Last time this year, we spoke of Jason's courage as he endured the isolation of an Iranian prison. 
This year, we see that courage in the flesh, and it's a living testament to the very idea of a free press and a reminder of the rising level of danger and political intimidation and physical threats faced by reporters overseas. Uh, and I can make this commitment that as long as I hold this office, my administration will continue to fight for the release of American journalists held against their will, and we will not stop until we, they see the same freedom as Jason had. home and abroad, journalists, like all of you, engage in the dogged pursuit of informing citizens and holding leaders accountable and making our government of the people possible. And it's an enormous responsibility. And I realize it's an enormous challenge at a time when the economics of the business sometimes incentivize speed over depth, and when controversy and conflict are what most immediately attract readers and viewers. Uh, the good news is there's so many of you that are pushing against those trends. And as a citizen of this great democracy, I am grateful for that. For this is also a time around the world when some of the fundamental ideals of liberal democracies are under attack, and when notions of objectivity and of a free press and of facts and of evidence uh, are trying to be undermined, or in some cases ignored entirely. And in such a climate, uh, it's not enough just to give people a, a megaphone. And that's why your power and your responsibility to dig and to question and to counter distortions and untruths is more important than ever. Taking a stand on behalf of what is true does not require you shedding your objectivity. In fact, it is the essence of good journalism. It affirms the idea that the only way we can build consensus, the only way that we can move forward as a country, the only way we can help the world mend itself is by agreeing on a baseline of facts when it comes to the challenges that confront us all. So this night is a testament to all of you who have devoted your lives to that idea, who push to shine a light on the truth every single day. Uh, so I want to close my final White House Correspondents' Dinner by just saying thank you. Um, I'm very proud of what you've done. It has been an honor and a privilege to work side by side with you to strengthen our democracy. And with that, I just have two more words to say. Obama out. <laughs>